Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. We hope you enjoy this sermon from a recent Sunday worship service. What actually is a stiff upper lip? According to the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, the idea of a stiff upper lip is traced back to ancient Greece, to the Spartans, whose cult of discipline and self-sacrifice was a source of inspiration to the English public school system <laughs> and to the Stoics. Stoic ideas were adopted by the Romans, particularly the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who wrote, if you are distressed by any external thing, it is not the thing which disturbs you, but your own judgment about it. And it is in your power to wipe out that judgment now. The concept reached England in the 1590s and was featured in the plays of William Shakespeare. His tragic hero Hamlet says, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. This apparently also explains the completely understandable sayings like, keep calm and carry on which was developed and used by the British government in 1939 in the face of possible attacks on England at the start of World War II. I get that there are reasons that are felt to keep a stiff upper lip and to keep calm and to carry on as we attempt to cope with events that challenge the every fiber of our being, like when there are overwhelming threats to our well-being and the events that set off the fight flight or flee response. It seems the sort of Puritan understanding of dealing with feelings and emotions followed the white folks who came to this country and set the course from which the dominant culture defined what was meant to be appropriate, manly, know your place in gender roles, and the story of America replete with rugged individualism. Now, for those of you of a certain age, you will recognize what came to me as I thought about rugged individualism. I thought about the image of the Marlboro Man, an incredibly successful marketing vehicle to sell Philip Morris cigarettes. And I looked up the Marlboro Man just to see what I could find about the Marlboro Man, and I found Stanford University has done research into the impact of tobacco advertising. And it said, with the rise of filter cigarettes in response to the increasing health concerns tied to smoking, Philip Morris decided to reposition its Marlboro brand for the filter market. What was originally a cigarette marketed as mild as may to attract primarily a female audience all at once gained a filter and became a man's cigarette. No longer would Marlboro advertise ivory tips to protect the lips or red beauty tips to match your lips and fingertips, as it had done since the 1920s. Instead, Marlboro underwent a, com a complete sex change in 1954. The brand's new mascot, the Marlboro Man, would exude rugged manliness in an effort to position Marlboro as a filter with flavor. Previously, most filter cigarettes were considered to be sissy or effeminate, lacking in flavor and meant for those who couldn't handle stronger brands. With the Marlboro Man campaign, Philip Morris worked to reverse this sentiment. The original Marlboro Men were excessive in their masculine virility. The models range from rough cowboys and sailors to alluring businessmen and academics. Whether the Marlboro Man was pictured preparing his gun or playing chess, he always sported, and I never knew this, a military-inspired tattoo on the back of his hand. In 1960, the tattoo, was, the tattoo was discontinued, but the message, that of intrigue and masculinity, remained vibrant in the Marlboro men of the decades to follow. 
advertising which portrays smokers as fearless, cowboys, soldiers, athletes, macho men, in means of conveying health reassurance. Smokers who identify with such imagery perceive that they, like the smoking role models portrayed in these ads, are too brave to fear smoking. Smoking is a very public badge of their fearlessness and willingness to face danger with indifference because they are immune to such anxieties. Only a slight manipulation by the marketing industry. For so long, this was the messaging about who we are supposed to be and how we are all supposed to behave, certainly in public. And without going into a possible doc doctoral dissertation of the civil rights movement and the women's movement and among other things like the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, the country has in fact, thankfully, changed and is widely discussed that part of the conservative backlash that's happening right now as a reaction to the evolution of what it means to be human and how the freedom movements also unleashed waves of a growing understanding of what it means to be a caring, feeling, loving, empathetic, compassionate, open, vulnerable, and expressive human being. It became okay to express oneself Actually, in so many ways over the last 50 years or so, expressing oneself has been encouraged perhaps more than ever before. Part of what it means to be human in so many ways is to try and find the path to our authentic selves, to have a deeper understanding of the feelings we carry and how they shape us. I have a story to tell you. A member of my previous congregation was an older person who had lived a long and fascinating life. She was a New England, New Englander. She was from an old New England family. And when I got to the congregation, there were many veiled cautionary statements about watching out for her because she was sharp and demanding and not always the warmest person. It was pretty amazing, but we hit it off from the very beginning. Not because I was not always the warmest person, but we hit it off from the very beginning. I would go and visit her at her house, and she would always have lots of suggestions and comments about pretty much everything. And of course, in the beginning, that was mostly the nature of our relationship. I have told this story before when I gave my very first sermon in my old congregation. We're in an outdoor amphitheater, and there were two matriarchs sitting one at the first row and one at the second row. And the first one gave me the thumbs up as I walked out. And the second one gave me the thumbs down. <laughs> she was the one who gave me the thumbs down. <laughs> but as time progressed and eventually I started to hear her stories, they were hard stories of loss and of struggle. Her life was amazing, but it sure wasn't easy. At some point, she called me, <clears throat> and I went to visit her, and she told me she was dying. It was cancer of some sort, and I've forgotten or have blocked it from my memory. She, of course, had planned her memorial service to a T, and that was part of the reason for the visit for that day, but what happened went well beyond that. She started to tell me a story of her son who had died from AIDS many years earlier, and she started to cry. I don't know how much she cried about that during her life, but I know that her way of coping was to keep a stiff upper lip and to carry on. As I sat there and she reached out to hold my hand, I was so deeply aware that we as humans desperately need each other. So many generations that were taught that coping meant not showing emotion in public, and coping means holding your emotions in, have suffered with that thought. Now to be clear, I'm not saying that after the service we should all sit here weeping and telling each other our deepest, darkest secrets, but what I am saying is sometimes things are hard, and I invite everyone to give themselves a little bit of a break. 
We've all been through so much in the last few years, and there are lots of things in our personal and communal lives that certainly can cause stress and anxiety and sadness, and at times, whether professional help or just a listening ear, we need each other. And part of needing each other is having a loving, safe, and brave space for us, if we need to, to cry. Of course, we also cry tears of joy and tears of laughter, and I guess that's part of the point, too. In our fullness as authentic human beings, we can and hopefully do experience a full range of emotion. I'm always so tempted to say that this is what this community, this congregation is for, and it is, and yet my hope is that someday the world will look more and more like how we are with each other here at UUCF. Certainly there are times where we must cope and we must protect ourselves and we must find the right time and the right place to weep. And yet I also hope that as time progresses, we can all find that place in our hearts both for ourselves and for others, where it is safe to be our authentic selves and to truly feel, to overcome the conservative roots that we all swim in that are so often held up as culturally normal. I can't see any way to any version of beloved community that doesn't understand our interdependence where we are fully seen. And if we can find this path through our hearts into the world, this beautiful, incredible, difficult, challenging, and interdependent world, maybe, just maybe, it will be okay for each and every one of us to be there for each other on the good days when all seems well and on the days when the challenges of this world well up and pour, for, pour forth from the reservoir of feelings in us all. Brene Brown said, we cannot selectively numb emotions, for when we numb the painful emotions, we also numb the positive ones. Tears help us know that we can still feel and that we are in touch with our humanity. Let us hope that being in touch with our humanity and the humanity of others never goes away. May that be so, and amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. To listen to more sermon podcasts, go to uucf.org slash worship hyphen services and scroll down to Sermon Podcasts.